tell you all you need to know about PLAB, all you need to do to be able to pass the PLAB, how we can help you at Hive Medical Academy, and hopefully get you moving very, very fast on that journey towards practicing in the UK. So we're going to tell you a bit about the, the PLAB process, about the PLAB exams, We'll tell you a little bit about what we can do for you uh, as uh, our future clients. And then we'll do a little bit of uh, practice uh, on some questions for the club. So just a few things uh, I want to mention. It is a, an interactive uh, class, but when, when we do the questions in particular, uh, please just post your answers into the chat and I'll be able to pick them up from there. Um, we'll try to keep all questions to the end. It just means that the uh, the class will run better as a result of that, unless there's something particularly urgent that you really need to um, to clarify or confirm in relation to a particular point. But generally, please just leave everything to uh, the end. So just moving on now to the actual information about PLAB. So the PLAB process, as you may or may not know, it uh, com is composed of two parts. There's PLAB 1, which is a knowledge-based, single best answer, multiple choice question exam. And uh, that is uh, the first stage of the PLAB process. PLAB 2 is, uh, PLAB 1 is can be done uh, in Pakistan and the centers are in Karachi and Islamabad. PLAB 2 is an in-person OSCE-style examination that tests your, uh, your communication skills, your clinical skills, and your application of knowledge. And that uh, is only possible uh, for you to sit in the UK. So you would have to obtain a visa and come to the UK to sit that. But today we're going to focus on, on PLAB 1. Okay, just a little bit about um, the NHS Foundation Program. Uh, so the requirements to sit the PLAB are very, very basic. All you need is just your medical degree. So you don't need any experience, uh, any clinical experience whatsoever. And in fact, it doesn't matter whether you are very senior or very junior. Um, an MBBS degree from a recognized university in Pakistan will allow you to sit PLAB 1. When you have completed the PLAB process, this is the kind of system that you will be coming into. Uh, so this slide just explains to you uh, the foundation program. So the foundation program is, is the, new, uh, the new scheme. It's not new anymore now, but it will be new for you guys. Uh, this is essentially the uh, basic training that a junior doctor completes when they, after they complete their medical uh, qualifications in the UK. So how you guys talk about house job, uh, what used to be called a house job here, which was one year of uh, pre-registration training, it's now two years. Uh, so you do uh, FY1, uh, for which, during which you're only granted provisional registration with the GMC and it's equivalent to an internship in other countries. And then after completion of, uh, of FY1, you move to FY2, which is where you have full registration with the GMC, and uh, you can then move onwards to specialty training. So um, in terms of where PLAB sits, uh, the PLAB, uh, one, uh, the PLAB level for the examinations is at the end of FY2. Okay, so just a little bit about uh, the specialty training in the UK. So foundation year program we've already mentioned, it's two years after graduation or after you move from abroad. And then you can decide which specialty you want to go into. And it varies, the length of training varies between three and nine years, depending on what you want to do. If you want to become a specialist in family medicine, you become a GP, that's three years training after FY2. And if you want to do uh, any of the other medical or surgical specialties, then 
it's usually seven to nine years in the other specialties. Okay, so let's come back to uh, PLAB now and the PLAB 1 exam in particular. So the key points to understand about the PLAB examination, as we've already mentioned, is a multiple choice, single best answer exam. So it's a knowledge-based exam. However, the knowledge you will have gained whilst in Pakistan, whilst in medical school in Pakistan, or even during your clinical experience, if you are quite experienced, is quite relevant to your practice in Pakistan. But the PLAB examination, which of course is uh, done by the GMC, they are the uh, registering body of doctors in the UK, they are concerned with you being able to, you having the correct knowledge to practice medicine in the UK. So as a result of that, it's probably uh, appropriate for me to say that although you will have the basic knowledge required, you will need some additional help in understanding how practice in the UK is different to practice in Pakistan or anywhere else in the world. And so that's where Hive Medical Academy will come in and we'll be, we'll be able to guide you, we'll be able to uh, teach you according to the GMC blueprint, which is the GMC syllabus. And we've done all of the work for that. And so all you will have to do is complete our program and hopefully that will uh, ensure that you are uh, successful in the PLAB 1 exam. So it is a knowledge-based exam. That means you will have to study, you will have to revise, and success is mostly hard work, as we know. It's, uh, it's You have to put in the hours, you have to put in the effort, and we would say for uh, PLAB, uh, PLAB 1, uh, about six months is ideal, but it can be done um, in around three to six months. So uh, you can start uh, your preparation um, quite in advance of that. So revision and study is crucial, but the key thing is, is you have to have the correct knowledge. You have to have the correct um, uh, awareness of the guidelines of what the GMC want you to know about, what clinical practice is like in the UK, what guidelines are used in the UK. And that's where Hive Medical Academy will be able to do all of that for you. All that preparation work is done. So all you have to do is enroll in the program, complete the study, and then sit the exam. So the PDSA cycle is something that as educationalists are quite keen on, and it's, it's used in uh, reference to change management usually. So it's where you do plan, do, study, and act. However, in relation to exams, I would change that slightly and, and uh, change it to plan, revise, practice, and analyze. So what that means is, as with any exam, and the PLAB, is, PLAB 1 is no different, you need to have a plan of what you need to do, what you need to cover. Then you need to do the study, you need to do the revision, you need to practice. And how are you going to practice? You're going to have to practice with lots of correct MCQ questions based on the GMC syllabus that we will provide for you. We've got bank of uh, several thousand questions that you'll be able to practice. And then you can look at the feedback from your questions. You will see the analysis. What were your strong areas? What were your weak areas? And then you go back to them and then you uh, improve them and then uh, try again. So even if you uh, feel like you are not prepared, not equipped, uh, you don't know where to start, that's where we come in. All our team um, are uh, based in the UK. We've all either graduated from the UK or worked in the UK for many, many years, decades in some cases, We've been examiners, we've been uh, supervisors, and we, we know exactly what is required, what the GMC wants from you. And so that's how Hive can help you get through your PLAB 1. So what does the GMC say? What do you need to know about? So you need to know about the common conditions, important conditions, and acute conditions. So common conditions usually refers to the conditions that 
are seen very frequently, usually in primary care or sometimes in accident and emergency department. Important conditions are the things that are chronic, that will be with patients for a long time, lifelong conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And the acute conditions are the serious or life-threatening conditions that will uh, make a patient present to the accident emergency department or present to an acute medical team or a, an acute surgical team. So what level is the GMC going to test at? I mentioned this slightly earlier. This uh, PLAB entry level is at the end of FY2. So that's the level that is required. So it's quite junior in, in training. And even if you've just got a medical degree, it is possible for you to be able to sit that exam as the GMC allow that. And you wouldn't need that much extra um, uh, knowledge in terms of uh, a jump from graduate level to uh, FY2. But the key thing is that ensuring that it's the correct knowledge. Okay, so what should you use to prepare? There's lots of G uh, resources that the GMC talk about, but how are you going to condense them all down into a syllabus or into a revision program? Well, you don't need to do that because Hive has done all that for you. So all you would need to do is you need to just enroll with us and you will be able to go through our uh, question bank. You'll be able to go through our mock examinations. You'll be able to go through our video and audio tutorials and live classes to ensure that you pass the PLAB one on the first attempt. So there are, there are four domains that the GMC talk about. They're in relation to knowledge, clinical practice, uh, communication, teamwork, and partnerships. So we'll go into more detail in future sessions, and you'll learn more about these uh, in in these in the uh, tutorials that are within our PLAB uh, course. But the key thing is, is these domains, as you'll see, the knowledge is only one of the four domains. So the other things that are in relation to communication being a safe practitioner, being uh, good at teamwork and being a good communicator, keeping patients safe, all of these kind of things, you won't be able to pick up from the books. You will only learn from somebody who's been through the process or who knows the syllabus and who can teach you in more detail. So the exam is not just a test of knowledge, but it's a test of your application of knowledge to that particular scenario that is being presented to you in the exam. The questions and the answers should always be about what's current best practice. And you will only know that if you are aware of what the current UK guidelines are, if you are aware of what the drugs are that are used in the UK, what are their indications, what are their contraindications, what should you be concerned with, what monitoring should you ensure is done, what checks should you do before and after, and all of these kind of things are very specific to uh, the medicine that's practiced in the UK. And the questions may also contain details about routine equipment that is used in hospitals, whether it's a nebulizer or whether it's a particular type of mask, oxygen mask, for example. It's equipment that is specific to use in the UK. So a little bit more now about what the actual questions are like and how you should, um, some a few tips about how you should approach the questions, even in your practice. So um, the format is single best answer. What that means is they're usually presented with a scenario or a clinical presentation, and then you're given five options. And the five options, some of them, in fact, all of them might seem potentially correct. But in a single best answer question, there's only one that is actually correct or one that is most correct. So that's what you have to bear in mind. You have to read the question properly. Everything you need to know, all the pieces of information that you need will be within the question itself. 
there will be certain features, certain words that are highlighted to you. And you'll learn more about these kind of words and what they are in our teaching sessions, what that means, what that should make you think about. And this should give you uh, the clues as to what the correct answer is going to be. Some general things about when approaching these kind of questions, you should try not to, although you're going to read the question properly, you might need to read it more than once, but try not to overthink what your answer is. And if you are unsure, you might have to go with your instinct for what feels right. But of course, the more revision, the more preparation you do, the more study you do, the more of our classes you can attend and the more of our uh, course that you complete, you have to rely less on your instinct and you'll be able to confidently answer the question. If a question is taking too long, you're really not sure what to do with it, you can leave it and then come back to the end, but never leave anything unanswered because you will then obviously definitely not be able to get the mark. Whereas if you at least try to have the best guess that you can, there's still a chance that you will pick up the mark for that, for that question. So what I've put on the screen now is the GMC link for the Plub Blueprint. Now, this I've shared with you because obviously um, this is what the GMC says uh, the syllabus covers. If you actually take the time to look at this, and it will be a good idea for you to look at this, you will realize, number one, how big the syllabus is. Number two, how poorly put together this document is in the sense that it's not very specific at all. It's essentially just a list of conditions. And number three, how difficult it is to actually ensure that you cover all of the syllabus in as much detail as is necessary, not too much detail, but not too little detail. How would you know? There's no information within this uh, document on how much that detail is. And that's where being with uh, a tutor, being with an academy who knows what the detail is, that puts you at an advantage. And that's where you should definitely uh, come into uh, our tutorials. Okay, so that's a little bit about Club One and what the GMC expect, what they want, what the exam is like. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about how Hive can help. So, as I mentioned, our team is made up of NHS consultants. NHS GPs, people who have been examiners for at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, uh, PLAB examiners, educational clinical supervisors, people who worked within the NHS for decades. They know all the requirements inside out and they are ready there to pass on that knowledge to you to help you pass these exams. Now, in addition to that, we've tailored our packages for PLAB1, and we've ensured that they cover all the requirements that a candidate might think about. So they start from, I'll go through them in detail in a few minutes, but they start from the very basic, which is just access to the uh, question bank, all the way through to having access to all the video, audio, um, and revision aids that you could possibly need to cover all of the content that the GMC syllabus wants you to cover. And this has been prepared and matched exactly both to the breadth of the syllabus and to the uh, level that is appropriate for the PLAB exam. So all you need to pass the PLAB exam is within our resources, and you will not need to venture outside the resource to learn about anything else because all of the guidelines, all of the latest developments and all of the changes to practice are within our resources and they are updated all of the time to ensure that they remain up to date. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, some of our packages as well as our great promotions that are on at the moment. So 
uh, our online subscription package, which is our very, very bottom package. This includes 24 seven access to course tutors via WhatsApp. You will not find this in any other academy whatsoever. We are available all of the time to help with anything you need and to answer any of your questions. Even the most senior members of the faculty, including myself, are available for anything that you might want to check on. You'll get access to more than 5,000 of the latest single best answer MCQs, and you will get access to a full Plug one teaching session on exam technique and tips and tricks. So what we've done today is I've just given you a little bit of a flavor about the exam. Just mentioned a few things that will be useful for you to bear in mind. But in a full class, we'll tell you about exactly how you can approach the questions. What are the buzzwords? What does each word mean? What should it suggest to you? How do you help decide between a couple of options if you're unsure? How do you narrow them down and all of these kind of things? Now, this package, which is normally £18 for three months or £30 for six months, it's a great price as it is anyway. This is currently on promotion and it's only for £15 for three months of access to uh, all the questions. So if you're thinking of sitting your exam in the next three to four months, and you just want to do some practice, this is the package for you. Moving on now to our uh, basic package. This includes, of course, again, 24 hour access to tutors, access to full 10 PLAB mock exams. So each, each PLAB one exam is 180 questions, <clears throat> excuse me. And in the real exam, you have three hours or 180 minutes which means you have one minute per question to answer the exam. So how are you going to uh, ensure that you have got the correct speed? You can work through and answer all 180 questions in the correct time. You need to do, uh, you need to actually do it in a mock exam scenario. And that's where you get access to 10 PLAB mock exams. Nobody else gives you access to 10 mock exams. In addition to this, you get as a bonus, 200 digital flashcards for rapid revision. So this covers 100 flashcards on clinical knowledge, clinical conditions, and 100 flashcards on knowledge of pharmacology and drugs. And all of these materials are available for 12 months. So that's a full year you can access all of this stuff. The normal price is £150, which again is already a fantastic price, but the current promotional pr price is only £100. Moving on now to our standard package, which obviously you get more in. In addition to the access to tutors, you get access to our full Club One video course, which has uh, over 100 hours of uh, video tutorials on all the topics that you will need to know about. So that's where you actually uh, can sit in front of the lecturer and listen to the uh, lecture on it. You get also get the 10 PLAB mock exams and you also get the 200 digital flashcards for the rapid revision. All of this material is available for 12 months. Normally this is 170 pounds. Currently promotion is on for 130 pounds. So just for 30 pounds extra from the previous package, you get a full, you get full access to lots and lots of videos covering all the topics with actual lectures and a uh, clinician teaching you about what you need to know. And our final and uh, premium package, which contains all of our PLAB1 resources. Uh, so that's uh, in addition to what we've already mentioned, the PLAB1 video course, 24 seven access to course tutors, 10 PLAB mock exams, 200 digital flashcards. You also get the complete audio course. So some people prefer, or they prefer to uh, do some learning or a vision while they are out for a walk or you've gone for a drive or you've gone to the gym. This is uh, the package for you. In addition, there'll be three full live PLAB1 teaching sessions with all the things that you need to know about 
uh, passing and the things that uh, can't be spoken about or learnt about from from a book. So this one, uh, the original price for which is two hundred and twenty five pounds, is this currently on promotion for only two hundred pounds. We also do once you. Um, go to the PLAB2 stage, we also uh, cover PLAB2 and everything you need for PLAB2, but we're not really concentrating on that today. And we also uh, have a full uh, selection of post-PLAB uh, services that you will need. So after you pass your PLAB exams, you will need to get a, um, you will need to, uh, get a clinical attachment. Without clinical attachments, you're not going to be successful in getting a job. You'll need to have a, an up-to-date professional CV, which most people don't have, and you will need lots of uh, kind of coaching on um, interviews and how to tackle questions and in interviews. They are all covered in our post club services. Okay, so just briefly, uh, something on um, what are hot topics. So you might see lots of people saying, oh, this is a hot topic or that is a hot topic. In reality, Anything and everything is a hot topic. And I'll go even further than that and say what is a hot topic for you is the is the topics that you are weak on. So how are you going to find out the topics that you're weak on? It's going to be through practice, through the uh, MCQ questions, through our question bank, seeing what areas are weak on, and then revising them areas over and over again. Okay, so we're just going to move on to do some questions now. So just, just to give you an idea of what the PLAB1 questions are like. Um, so I'll read out the question. I'll read out the options for you. Uh, post your answers in the chat. That's the easiest way and it'll result in the least amount of interruption. And then we'll go through how that is uh, the answer. So... You're reviewing a 43-year-old man with a history of polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. You suspect a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. What is the single result that is most consistent with the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus? So, first option, random plasma glucose of 10.5 millimoles per litre. Option B, fasting plasma glucose of 6.5 millimoles per litre. Option C, two-hour oral glucose tolerance test, glucose concentration of 7.5 millimoles per litre. Option D, a HbA1c of 50 millimoles per mole. And option E, a HbA1c of 6.2%. So what do you think? Remember the key points of ensuring you've read the question knowing what the question is asking, and then having a go at what you think the answer is. Just to highlight uh, even a difference here, I'm sure that the units used in Pakistan uh, of glucose are frequently different to the ones used here. So how are you going to know about what is the correct range for normal, what is diabetes, only through going through a proper program? Okay, so, so far two people have said Option C. Anybody else? Any other guesses? Only two brave people in the class today. Okay, we'll take that as the answer for the whole class. So everyone thinks it's option C. If my screen will move. Correct answer is option D, HbA1c of 50 millimoles per mole. So what were the key features in this question? So obviously talking about diagnosis of diabetes, how are you going to know? There's a few tests here that can be used. And uh, in the UK, quite a long time ago now, uh, well over 10 years ago, uh, the normal diagnosis of diabetes moved from just plasma glucose concentrations to uh, HbA1c. Although you can still diagnose 
diabetes from plasma glucose results. You can still diagnose diabetes from two-hour oral glucose tolerance tests. But if you knew what the cutoff was, so uh, the requirement for a diagnosis of diabetes for a random plasma glucose is above 11.1. Fasting plasma glucose is above 7. And oral uh, uh, and uh, OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, which is used usually in pregnancy, that has a different uh, diagnostic criteria as well than uh, to the one that is in front of you. And uh, so HbA1c of 50 millimoles is the only answer that is correct. And that is why that one is the correct answer. Okay, so moving on to the next question. A 60-year-old lady is reviewed three days after an MI. She states that she feels very breathless. And on examination, you can hear a pansystolic murmur that is loudest at the lower left sternal edge. So what is the single most likely diagnosis? Option A, mitral regurgitation. Option B, mitral stenosis. Option C, ventricular septal defect. Option D, tricuspid stenosis. And option E, Dresler syndrome. So what are your thoughts, guys? Okay, so we have A and we have B. Any other answer? Okay, so uh, two answers. We have A, uh, we have suggestion A and we have B. The correct answer is C, which is ventricular septal defect or VSD. So again, all the information that you will require is within the question. It's after an MI. So that's obviously very important. She feels breathless. That you know could be the case with any of these other conditions. But the key, very key parts to the question are obviously on examination, you hear a pansystolic murmur, which is loudest at the left sternal edge after an MI. So obviously these things will point towards post MI complications, but specifically to these ones, because all of these uh, problems, mitral regurg, mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, they will have different types of murmurs that sound with a different description. Dresler syndrome is obviously completely separate. And that is why ventricular septal defect is uh, the correct answer. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So 76-year-old woman with poorly controlled hyper hypertension developed sudden visual loss in her right eye. Visual acuity on the right is reduced to hand movements only. So she can only see movements of the hand. Visual acuity on the left is six out of six, which means it's fine. On examining her fundi, you note engorgement of the retinal veins, disc edema, multiple flame-shaped hemorrhages, and cotton wool spots across the entire retina. So the question is asking, what is the single most likely diagnosis? A, central retinal vein occlusion, B, vitreous hemorrhage, C, central retinal artery occlusion, D, diabetic maculopathy, and E, wet age-related macular degeneration. So please give your suggestions. No guesses in this one? Somebody has said A. Thank you, Dr. Shah. So Dr. Shah is either very observant or he's uh, very knowledgeable when it comes to uh, visual emergencies. 
Okay. So the correct answer is in fact A, central retinal uh, vein occlusion. Now, how are you going to know the difference between uh, central retinal vein occlusion and uh, the other conditions that are mentioned, such as uh, central retinal artery occlusion? Well, obviously, if you know and you've done your revision, you've completed the tutorials, you will know that retinal vein occlusion uh, has a presentation that is as described in this question. Retinal artery occlusion presents differently with different features on the retina. Diabetic maculopathy obviously is completely different. When you have vitreous hemorrhage, you have blood within the actual vitreous itself and uh, age-related macular degeneration won't usually give you flame-shaped hemorrhages or cotton wool spots, um, you know, or, uh, across the entire retina itself. So you need to be aware that you have to cover uh, visual complications. You have to cover these kind of things within the syllabus. And then obviously that will uh, equip you with the, with the correct knowledge. Okay, so coming on to the next question. 62-year-old female smoker presents with weight loss, dysphagia, intermittent vomiting. On examination, you note a mass in the left iliac fossa and also uh, palpate a fullness in the right iliac fossa. An ultrasound scan demonstrates bilateral solid ovarian masses with clear, well-defined margins. What is the single most likely underlying diagnosis. So the options are primary ovarian carcinoma, esophageal carcinoma, gastric carcinoma, benign ovarian tumor, or functional ovarian cysts. So 62-year-old female with these examination findings, this ultrasound scan, what is the correct answer? So a couple of people, Dr. Shahik, uh, Dr. Osama have said option A. Any other guesses from anybody before we go to the answer? Okay, so a couple of you have said primary ovarian carcinoma. You're probably thinking that's pretty sensible uh, answer based on the ultrasound scan findings. However, the correct answer is C, gastric carcinoma. So you might be a bit confused. Well, let's just go back to the question. You've got a 62-year-old female uh, patient who presents with, note the first three things that you're told, weight loss, dysphagia, and intermittent vomiting. So what would weight loss, dysphagia as well? Okay, let's leave the weight loss aside. What would dysphagia have to do with primary ovarian carcinoma? Nothing really. So this presentation is a specific, a specific type of tumor called Frukenberg tumors that uh, result from a gastric primary, then going to the ovaries as a secondary tumor. So key parts of the question, the information right at the beginning tells you that this is, uh, you know, this patient has presented with gastric symptoms, not presented with any gynecological symptoms really, but you've found on an ultrasound scan that they're ovarian masses and you've felt something on examination as well. So this patient has actually got something called Krukenberg tumors, which are from a primary gastric cancer that then moves to the ovaries. And so again, just reiterating the point on knowing uh, about certain conditions, knowing what you need to cover, and then being able to apply that to the question. That's the, the key part of lab one. I think this is the final question now. 
so hopefully I put this one I put this one in there because I thought it will be a nice and easy one for uh, colleagues from the subcontinent. A 44 year old businessman returns from a trip to West Africa with headaches and intermittent fever. Thick and thin films are sent to the lab and a diagnosis is made of malaria. So the patient is started on treatment, but his condition deteriorates and he develops jaundice, renal failure and hemoglobin urea. What is the single most likely causative organism in this scenario? So option A, Plasmodium falciparum. Option B, Plasmodium ovale. C, Plasmodium vivax. D, Plasmodium malariae. And E, Plasmodium nolesi. Okay, so we have one guess for A, another guess for A. Any any other guesses? What is the single most likely causative organism of the problem in this patient? And both Dr. Shah, Dr. Shahek, and perhaps other people in the uh, webinar were correct. Plasmodium falciparum. So obviously, as you know, this is the commonest cause of malaria, but in particular, usually causes this uh, uh, triad was a complication where you get jaundice, renal failure, and hemoglobin urea. So, uh, very well done, guys. That's just a few questions, four, five or six questions, I think, there, just to give you an idea of what the single best answer questions are like, what kind of uh, scenarios are mentioned, and how you need to think about the knowledge that you have or don't have in some instances and try to apply it to the question in front of you. So just to recap what we've spoken about today, uh, planning and preparation is key. The GMC blueprint is a huge syllabus and the syllabus for PLAB 1 um, and of course uh, PLAB 2 is huge. That's because as an FY to doctor, <clears throat> you're expected to work in medical, surgical specialties, in primary care. You need to know about all the conditions that can present in them scenarios. And you need to know what are the up-to-date resources, what are the up-to-date guidelines, what is best practice in the UK. That's where Hive comes in. We'll be there with our resources all ready for you, all the uh, syllabus set out, the plan is set out for you, all you have to do is do the revision. So remember, plan, revise, practice, analyze. So uh, think about what you need to do, do some study, practice lots of questions, and then go back and see the weak areas, and then practice, practice, and practice. So this is just the beginning, just to give you an idea of what uh, kind of plan one preparation is all about. We've got much, much more to come, and hopefully I'll be seeing some of you in our uh, PLAB1 tutorials, and you'll be seeing more of me in our PLAB1 resources. Thank you very much, guys. I'm going to hand back over to uh, Sana now, uh, and uh, we're just going to, both myself and uh, Dr. Shkiel are here, if uh, anybody has any questions, please uh, go ahead and um, either myself or Dr. Shkiel uh, or Sana can answer. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, you, you, you can feel free to now uh, unmute yourself and, and speak. Or if you want to enter a question into the chat, you can do it that way also. Anyone can unmute yourself and you can ask any question if you wanted to ask any related to the registration, related to the uh, company services or anything you wanted to know about the plan. So feel free to ask anything about the whole process, um, about any part of the process. 
about our resources uh, or about anything else you might have in mind. Uh, okay, so either we have a very shy group or everyone knows everything there is to know about PLAB. So uh, if there's a final chance to ask it, it's not often you get myself and Dr. Shkiel on a live webinar here ready to answer any questions you might have. So uh, do, do stick your hand up or just put your mic on. Uh, a couple of minutes if and the webinar. I think Dr. Omar, you have guided very well and uh, that's why we are not getting any queries. Oh, uh, look at that. Know. Someone's got a question. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so is it possible? Thank you, uh, Dr. Sama. Thank you for asking a question. Is it possible to move together with family to the UK after completion of training? Uh, and I think Dr. Skill will be best to answer this. Is our Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Sama, yeah, you can move uh, with your family. The once you pass GMC registration, you have the GMC registration, you will apply for the job. The day you get the job, your visa status will change automatically. So after that, you can bring your family, your parents, or even you want to bring your neighbors, whoever you want to bring, you can bring it. That's not issue at all. Uh, okay, if there are no further questions, then we will end there, I think, Sana. Um, um, if nobody's got anything they want to ask. So I think hopefully you guys should be in our lab group. If you think of something afterwards, or if you uh, think of something at any other time, just reach out in the PLAB group or reach out to Sana, our country head, or any one of us, and uh, we'll be ready to help you anytime. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for attending. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for joining us today. We have shared all our details, and uh, you will, you can contact all our team members in Pakistan and UK for all the guidance for PLAB journey. And inshallah, we are here 24 by 7 to support you. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I love us.